Our first interview is with Dr. John Patrick, who's not a stranger to many of you, but for those of you who may not know, John is a professor of biochemistry and pediatrics at the University of Ottawa. He's an active member of the Canadian CMDS. He did his medical training in London and served as a medical missionary in Africa. Uh, John speaks frequently both to Christian and secular groups. In fact, one of the best people I know to communicate the Christian message to those who don't know Christ. He's able to communicate to groups about moral issues in medicine, culture, and an integration of faith and science. He's got something special for us on this tape. John, as you travel across the United States, Canada, and literally around the world, what do you see as the foundational issue of what you're seeing out there in culture? Uh, why are we having such a problem in uh, in communicating truth and, and really relating to our society on a lot of the important ethical uh, issues of our day? It's like asking for the meaning of life in 10 minutes, but... Let's start with the good news. The good news is that people realize there's a problem. I've had some wonderful question periods in Southwestern Medical School in Dallas a a little while back. I had a couple of evening sessions and a breakfast session with uh, medical students that went for several hours because uh, having got their face straight, they need to move on to the next step. And I think one of the problems is with the church. And uh, the problem from my perspective is that a lot of us seem to believe that once we have been born again or converted, uh, that's it. Whereas in reality, of course, that's the beginning of it all, not the end of it all. It's the means to enter into the game, into the action, into the drama. And a lot of people are not living it that way. And I guess that what needs to happen in the Christian uh, community of physicians is to work out what it means to be saved day by day in the practice of medicine. How do you practice medicine in the modern world in a being saved mode, if you like? Explain that to me. What what do you mean? Kind of uh, unpack that for us. Okay, well, most of us, in fact, it seems to me probably 70% of Christian physicians practice what I call schizophrenic Christianity. During the week, they are indistinguishable from their colleagues. And on weekends, they are well-known members of their local church. In other words, what happens on Sunday is not distinctively apparent throughout the week. And I think our being saved, present continuous, means that we are to redeem the medical culture if we can. And by God's grace, we can. After all, medicine has a much longer history than mere science. It goes back a lot further, and we need a basis for that. And we don't know how to talk about it. First of all, our practice of medicine is tacitly atheistic. Now, this is much more subtle than communism. Nobody says you can't believe in God in the practice of medicine, but they behave as though the policies of medicine should be formulated as though he does not exist or as though he's not important. Hence, you meet this problem all the while with talking about abortion. Uh, I'm sure you've met it where people listen to your view and think that you're out of the ark or something like that. And so what we have to do is to show that they're cheating. They're actually parasitic on us, not we on them. So what we need to do is to work out what would you have to believe in order for abortion to be ethical. And I put it to you that what you'd actually have to believe is that ultimately uh, life is absurd. In Canada, the main abortionist is a man called Henry Morgenthaler who lost all his family in Auschwitz. Not surprisingly, he doesn't believe in a God of love. I think we can all sympathize with that. But he inherits the Jewish tradition of being compassionate towards those who are suffering. And no one can pretend that a woman who's got a pregnancy which is problematic for her isn't suffering psychologically at that point. Now, what Henry Morgenthaler sees is two ultimately absurd human lives. He's a very honest man. He doesn't pretend that he does anything else than snuff out human life at that stage of development. But he says... When I have completed the abortion, the net happiness in the world has increased, whereas nothing has happened to the absurdity. In other words, until you are self-conscious, you cannot appreciate happiness. So if life is about happiness, then you can kill an unself-conscious, absurd, intrauterine human being to make an extrauterine human being happier, but only if life is ultimately absurd. Now put Mother Teresa next to the bed. What does she see? She sees two eternally significant lives, one of whom is about to put her soul in jeopardy. What's the right thing to do now? My goodness, it's the exact opposite. So what we have to learn in our medical schools is that there are two competing understandings of what it means to be human. And that's what we need to talk about. 
Well, it's, it's it's really the worldview issue, isn't it? It's uh, it's how people see uh, what human beings are and how the world is organized and what our purpose here is on Earth. And uh, if you come with that set of a different set of assumptions, you automatically come to a different conclusion. That's right. And I think one of the things I heard said last week, I thought it was so true. We keep discussing about how we should treat something without deciding what that something is. Yes. And yeah. uh, and that's the issue in, in the, you know, stem cell research, abortion, or whatever the issue is. If we pick up a rock and a kitten, we can treat a rock by giving it a throw, but we don't give the kitten a throw because it's life, and we don't treat life that way. That's right. And unfortunately, we have not come to that conclusion about or agreement about what life is and what it means for an embryo or for a fetus. Yep. Henri de Lubac, the philosopher in the mid-20th century, called this the drama of atheistic humanism, and he said something interesting. He said the 20th century was dominated by a new idea, and that was atheistic humanism. He said everyday atheism has been common enough, but this was a new atheism with a thought-out worldview, what you're saying. And its prophets were Comte, Feuerberg, Marx, and Nietzsche, and they all taught that the God of Christians was an antagonist the enemy of human dignity. And he contrasted this. He said, the ancient world experienced biblical Christianity as the great liberation from fear and fate. And you've seen that in Africa and Mm -hmm. so have I. But the new atheists proclaimed that God was limiting human greatness. Now, they had it worked out. The only trouble is it didn't work. It was called communism and it was called fascism. And so now we've reached the stage in the 21st century where we know that man can organize the world, but when he organizes it without God, man always suffers. So we need a humanism, we need an understanding of ourselves that will get over this. And to my mind, the only way you can do this is by recognizing that you're a creature. And that discussion is why the evolutionary debate is so important. Darwin understood that that if he was right, then the only reason for action was a genetic benefit. And it had nothing to say about truth. And there was no space for compassion. Uh, Compassion is illogical in a natural selection process. So where does medicine stand in that setting? The the, the technique, I think, is to push the opposition back to the logical conclusion of what it says it believes. And when you do that, you get very very interesting responses, most of all from non-Christians, interestingly. Uh, John, one of the things you do so well is then to interact with those other worldviews, point out the fallacies and the inconsistencies, which I think are so uh, so apparent when you really begin analyzing these, and confronting that other worldview with the Christian worldview. Maybe you can help us in that area. Okay. The, the first question for me, then, is, is, in the beginning, what? The evolutionists don't want to talk about the beginning. They want to talk about the process. Interesting, a little humility is coming in in the form of humor. There's a a lovely joke going around the uh, molecular biology community at the moment in which uh, the molecular biologists become so confident that they say to God, we could make a better cell than you. You really screwed up in a few points. God says, right, next Thursday we'll each make a new cell and see who comes up with the best one. So they come to the laboratory the next week, and uh, as they enter the laboratory, God shakes his finger and says, no, 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 bring your own dirt. <laughs> That's great. And, and that, that issue is important for us. In the beginning, what, what they're asking us to believe is, in the beginning, nothing. Creation ex nihilo doesn't look so crazy now. Uh, none of them believes that the cosmos is eternal. They're trying to get out of it by playing with concepts of time. But in the beginning, what is now a fundamental question? Belief in God is not stupid. It it gives a a way of looking at the world that makes so much more sense than anything else. It makes sense of our own humanity. It makes sense of the fact that we actually feel compassion for one another, and we know it's important. It therefore makes sense that we care for the unborn and we care for the disabled. Whereas if the evolutionary view is correct, then euthanasia and the killing of the disabled and all those kinds of things are, are rational. And as I think Jay Bachevsky said, uh, we're still logical, we're just more slow about it than we used to be. So we work our way towards the inevitable consequences of what we say we believe. So the first question is always in the beginning, what? I think in any reasonable conversation you can get people to see, well, the belief in no God is no more provable than the belief in God. In fact, it's slightly less provable. So maybe I should give you that point that Either there is or there is not a God. So where do we go from here? Well, we look at the consequences. If I believe in God, where do I go from there? What kind of God? 
and you end up discussing the various great religions of the world and the differences between them. And of course, for medicine, it, that's a pushover. We say, well, from the point of view of the practice of medicine, the truth of the matter is that the vast majority of the development of medicine occurred in societies where Christianity had been dominant for at least 1,500 years before science took over. And science, in fact, doesn't answer any of the existential question. It provides us techniques, but the real problem is you're meeting all the while with stem cell research and abortion and euthanasia is not what can we do, but what ought we to do? So the next question is, where does this concept of ought come from? Why do we feel obligated to do certain things, sometimes against our own will? And of course, we don't do the Darwinian thing. If you're standing on the bridge and somebody's fallen in the river, you don't do a swift calculation of how many genes you share with the person in the water and jump faster for your identical twin than you do for anyone else, uh, which is what you should do if you're a Darwinian. No, you are driven, you're impelled by something within you, and we need an explanation of what that is. Christianity has a wonderfully sophisticated explanation of what that is. It calls it the image of God, and it helps to explain our lives. From the point of view of medicine, we have good reason to take Christianity seriously because it was historically important, and people who forget their history are in trouble. We need to think our way through our history more carefully than we have done. So that's question number two. Then they say, but religion has caused all the problems. I had this happen to me just last week at a wedding, uh, sitting next to a, a very bright uh, young woman who came from a Jewish background but doesn't practice any kind of uh, religious practice. And she said, well, isn't religion the cause of all the wars in the world? And uh, I had to say to her, no, I don't think it is. Uh, I think you can make that case if you wish to be superficial. But at the end of the day, we always have to decide what we ought to do. And uh, the 20th century, with its rational humanism, has had the worst wars that anyone ever had. The abolition of God from the public square has been a disaster. And you face it all the while on CNN and everywhere else, where tacitly God is not taken seriously and the history is not taken seriously. So we, we start talking about how this came to be. That means... We need to know a little bit more about the history of science and the history of medicine than we do. Uh, we need to uh, make the points more clearly. Yeah, I find one of the things that works wonderfully at the end of a lecture, you have done a lovely printing up of uh, Sydenham's Oath. I can read that in any secular audience at the end of an hour. It takes an hour to prepare for it, but at the end of the hour, I say to uh, these secularists in Grand Rounds, I want to read to you, my favorite description of what it means to be a doctor. And I read that lovely Sydenham piece about uh, what we all need to consider. As I'm reading it, I want you to ask yourself the question, if you were dying and the man who came through the door was that man, and you could say, that's my doctor, would you be content? And you know, I've never had anyone say no. And yet right in the middle, he says the key thing that we need to recognize that Christ showed the dignity of the human being by becoming himself human, and more than that, dying to redeem us. And you can say that in any secular university if you build up to it appropriately. It's, uh, it's a marvelous moment. The, the, the next question that I come to is, is medicine primarily a technical activity or a moral activity? In other words, are we primarily concerned about techniques, or are we concerned about something deeper? Now, as you always say, and I agree with you, the, the first requirement of a Christian doctor is that he be a technically competent doctor, that he practice good medicine at that level. But that in itself is not enough, because what you do with every patient you see is fundamentally you ask them the question, how can I help, help you to decide what you ought to do in the current setting? In other words, it's a moral question, because there's that word ought in there. It has the the concept of a choice that's not made for you by the physical facts. I've been asking physicians in the last few months the, the following question. Those of you who have been in practicing medicine for 30 years or so, what change has there been in the proportion of patients who come to you with diseases for which there is a significant proportion of self-induction? In other words, are there more patients now coming to you with problems for which they are at least in part responsible than they used to be? Well, the answer is very interesting. It's very consistent. Most of them say, well, I suppose 30 or 40 years ago, probably only 30% of patients came with 
a large element of self-induction in their disease. But now it's probably 70%. Now, what we're talking about at this stage then is people who behave in ways that are counterproductive to their own health. They're not doing what they ought to do. That's a moral question again. And of course, people like David Larson and the like are making it clear that when you get your moral question right, the health outcomes are very much better than when you don't. In a purely practical sense, America would be well advised to have everybody in church regularly and committed to that ethos, to that community, because it would dramatically reduce the cost of medical care in North America. And I'm glad to see that CMDA and others are pushing this particular uh, development because we need to talk about this a lot more. Medicine being a moral activity uh, means that you need a moral basis upon which to, to work. And so you've got to start unpacking this with your patients. I think the saline solution helps with that, but I think we can go a lot further in getting people to uh, think their way through it. I think you touched on something else, John, that I, I think uh, is really important, and that is you know, the technical competence of the physician or dentist is important, but the other side of the coin is the virtue of the physician or dentist. And the best insurance against unethical action and treating people in the right manner, doing the right thing, is a virtuous person who is the physician. And we've gotten away from that with this whole segregation in our society that you can have a public life and a private life and these two don't really make any difference it doesn't make a difference what you do in private uh, as long as you uh, do things okay in public you know it's not the virtuous person anymore it's just a, a, a set of principles which we play lip service to yeah and no no emphasis on character at all yeah so it's the, that's what's so worrying about walking clinics and the like that you have no idea what the person treating you is like and, of course, uh, we're now developing a group of young people coming through who have been taught for 30 years that they're just animals. And some of them are beginning to behave that way. They're not going to have a great deal of problem about killing the elderly. Um, I've already seen that uh, a couple of years ago in first block of the medical school with a problem-based learning system. There's a, a case where uh, a 65-year-old has uh, a bacterial pneumonia. The point of the case is just to get the students thinking about pharmacokinetics, you know, why do you use one antibiotic twice a day and another four, why is one intravenous and another oral, those kinds of questions. But uh, my group got the objectives of the week very quickly and I went and got my coffee and was going back to my office and then I met a, a French, a francophone uh, doctor that I knew who was actually 65 and had come back to teach at the francophone group because we were short of uh, French-speaking tutors. And uh, he was obviously upset, and I said to him, what's the matter? And he said, those guys, these are the Quebecois, the most postmodern people in North America. He said, they spend half an hour discussing whether a 65-year-old with bacterial pneumonia should be given comfort only. After all, he wasn't working, his family had grown up. Uh, what reason did he have to go on living? Uh, maybe we should just make him comfortable. Uh, that's a frightening concept, isn't it? Yeah. And when they can think in those terms, in the first few months of medical school, what are they going to be like when they've completed our course in applied cynicism? <laughs> Is that what should be on most of the, uh, the diplomas you get for medical school, uh, associate <laughs> degree in applied cynicism? Well, that's what, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, they actually do. And what's even worse, of course, is that a lot of physicians are now practicing a kind of medicine that upsets them because they're beholden to people who are more and more distant, HMOs, administrators and the like, who set protocols and targets so that the freedom of the physician is being undermined uh, because, as Polanyi said a long while ago, when we lose a moral consensus, the only way you can maintain order is by submission to a single center of unlimited secular power. Now, that's happening. And so... The practice of medicine is less satisfying because you are controlled in what you can do. You have to defend decisions that you would not have had to defend in the past. Uh, you're not allowed to use moral and social uh, arguments in the way that we would have used them in the past. Uh, it's a deeply dissatisfying situation. And in addition, you're practicing defensive medicine in which you're doing things that aren't actually necessary and may even have some risk attached to them for the patients in order to defend yourself against lawsuits. That's a world moving towards control by a secular power rather than, as you were saying, control by virtue and character. 
Now, the push that we're developing in Canada slowly is this Hippocratic Registry of Physicians for precisely these reasons. And we push it on four, under four headings. If your physician does not believe in God, ultimately, if he doesn't have transcendence in his life, why would he not kill you when it's convenient for him to do so, especially if he wins on the deal? Uh, you and I have seen that in Africa where the witch doctor will kill for money. Uh, it was the norm before Hippocrates. And once Hippocrates started changing it, it took several hundred years before it became the dominant mode not to kill. So unless you fear judgment, you are rationally more corruptible than somebody who does fear uh, judgment. If you don't fear for your soul, you are definitely more corruptible than if you do. So that's number one. Number two is that Hippocrates understood that medicine was a moral activity. It was about what we ought to do. And that also requires, ultimately, religion. And thirdly, he understood that the sanctity of life is the key indicator of this for medicine. That's why it's so important and why we're struggling with it so much, because it's central to the practice of medicine um, as a Christian. Ultimately, any individual patient we see is more important than America or Canada, because America, Canada, Britain, or anywhere else are transient in historical terms. But every patient we see has an eternal existence. So there is a deep sense in which the individual is more important than the nation. But with evidence-based medicine and all the like, especially in its worst expressions, we're moving away from that. We're saying the good of the whole, expressed in economic terms, is more important. We need to think our way through this uh, very much more deeply than we have done so far. But the sanctity of life is also key because everybody talks about human rights now. But as Robert Spitzer points out, if you're not alive, you cannot be a rights bearer. So the right to life must precede all other rights because all other rights are dependent upon it. Uh, and so we, we need to, to make that point very strongly, that yes, we believe in human rights, and because we believe in human rights, we believe that the sanctity of life is central because without life you cannot be a rights bearer. And the fourth point that Hippocrates understood was that the moral integrity of the physician is more important than the desires of the government, the HMO, or indeed the patient, because our conscience and our right to conscience is fundamental to our meaning as a human being and to everything we understand. And it's very easy to demonstrate this. Students come to me regularly, particularly in family practice, where they're, when they're doing that rotation, they say, I've been told that even though I think abortion is wrong, I must refer for abortion when someone wants to be referred. And I'm uncomfortable about that. What do I say? And I say to them, well, uh, fortunately, you live in a postmodern age where your mentors, teachers, and professors have to respond to your questions. So what you say is, um, well, before we get to that, I think there's another question that I need you to answer. Uh, do you mind if I ask it? And of course, I'll say yes. You say, well, do you wish you and your family to be cared for by a physician with or without moral integrity? It's a stunning question, of course, because... Nobody can say they want a doctor without moral integrity. Uh, and once they've said that, you say, but don't you see what you're asking me to do is to impugn my moral integrity, thereby diminishing me in the practice of medicine for the rest of my life for all patients. Do you really wish to do that? The answer, of course, is no. And then you can go on and take it a step further. You say, look, all the data shows that over 50% of Americans are pro-life. And yet we don't have a single medical school that is unashamedly pro-life. looks to me as though we're in need of affirmative action. We say that medicine is patient-centered, patient-ordered, yet 50% of the patients are not having a medical school within which their fundamental principles are the basis for learning medicine. We need to start moving in that, and I think you know, with the current Bush administration, might be a good time to go for the first medical school in North America where... It's unashamedly pro-life because 50% of Americans are unashamedly pro-life. There ought to be a pro-life medical school. In fact, 50% of them ought to be pro-life if we're a democracy, shouldn't they be? Well, Melinda, of course, has been in the forefront of trying to honor life, but I still think there's a need for a school that unabashedly trains people with uh, Hippocratic medicine and a, and a Christian worldview because I think that's going to become more and more important. Yeah. Let me ask you this, John. You know, we talk a lot about uh, how to confront the culture, and you are so good at it, and I, I'm just putting myself in the seat of that doctor that's driving his car or shaving or mowing the lawn today and listening to this tape. And they're they're just, 
you know, eating this up, what you're saying, but realizing there's so much more on the table that they have not had an opportunity to partake of. How can someone who really wants to become more effective in this area of confronting other worldviews, being a non-schizophrenic uh, Christian, uh, how can they go about uh, getting that knowledge that they need and, and being mentored in this area? Well, that's a wonderful question, David. Thank you for serving it up. One of the things that's happened to me in this last year is, as you know, I've taken uh, two years unpaid leave from the university in order to do more speaking along these lines. And uh, thank God to the Americans who take you seriously and take you up. So one of the really nice things that's happened, instead of flying in on Friday night and out on Sunday night, I've had one or two trips for over longer periods. Uh, I had one in Montana recently in which I ended up staying for about a week. And as well as talking to the physicians many times um, and uh, doing grand rounds and uh, preaching in church, I, I did a commencement address for uh, the high schools in the town. Um, but it gave me time to get to know the physicians a, a bit more than I usually do. And by the end of the, the week, uh, we'd had, a, I think, a good time. But what I said to them was that I, I think you need not just what you're already doing, which is to have a weekly prayer meeting together. And that's wonderful because we all need that kind of support. But you need now to engage your minds in the area of culture and ethics because the way we win this battle is by making the Christian culture richer than it has been. So I think we need a course in how the medical culture developed. And that's what we plan to do in Augustine College. And in fact... Um, one of the things I hope will come out of this tape is I would like folk who would like to do it to contact me or Augustine College and, uh, and so that we can develop a list of people who'd like to do it. We would like to do it next June, and we'd be open to adjusting the dates to, to meet uh, the needs of the maximal number of people. Uh, and what we'd like to do is to begin uh, the first week's teaching on the ancient roots of myths. And instead of uh, just going narrowly for the ethics line, we would like to uh, try for a week to teach physicians about how philosophy, literature, ethics, science, medicine, mathematics, uh, art, architecture, and music all interact in the ancient period. So the first session we'd like to run would be the ancient roots of medicine. And you'd have one day with five of us, come for five days. So uh, you'd have a day with me and a day with uh, Graham Hunter and a day with Ed Blado and a day with Edith Humphrey, and you'd see how the ancient scriptures, how philosophy, how science was developing in the pre-Golden Age of Greece period, um, perhaps going into the Golden Age. And uh, at the end of that, we would hope that you would be beginning to lay a foundation that would bring you back again for subsequent sessions so that ultimately we could give you uh, the education you didn't get at medical school because you were too busy learning the Krebs cycle, which you've since forgotten. Whereas this stuff, uh, you will remember because it will change the way you think. So if people are interested, they could email me, jpatrick at uwatua.ca, or they could, uh, better still, email Augustine College at augcol, A-U-G-C-O-L-L, -L, at magma.ca for Canada, that's M-A-G-M-A, or go to the Augustine College website, which I think is www.augustinecollege, one word. And I think it's .ca, but it may be .org. But uh, you're sophisticated. You can get to it one way or another. And let us know whether you'd be interested in this. Um, this is really what I want to see happen because it's taken me two or three years to realize there are not many people doing what I do, and I'm not getting younger. So it's time to train some other people to do it. Uh, there's no way I can get round to, to do all that I would like to do. Uh, you know the same thing. So the fundamental task is to teach someone to fish rather than to fish myself. That's true, and, and it's so basic to so many different issues. And it's, I think one of the distractions is to work just on the issues without dealing with the basic assumptions, worldview assumptions, and how you approach uh, other people with different worldviews. And and once you do that, a lot of other things flow out of it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. This, it, this it's is... a much bigger question than mere medicine right. and mere ethics. And by the way, Ottawa is a wonderful place for holiday, especially with the Canadian dollar at the level that it's at these days. But within an hour or so of Ottawa, you, you can uh, put a canoe in the water and load up with your goods and uh, the rest, and you can go canoeing for a week with your kids and not see anybody most days uh, with prepared campsites 
along the way. You canoe and portage, canoe and portage. Take you a week to cross Algonquin Park, and you could do that. Uh, you're tempting me, John. You're tempting me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just one of the things. And, of course, uh, Ottawa has... Uh, it's a lovely setting just across the river. There's French hotels and uh, the largest log cabin in the world, which is actually a luxury hotel. There's obviously golf. We don't have snow all the year up here. We, we try and keep Canadian summers a secret, but uh, uh, today it's 27 degrees here, so we're in and out of the pool quite often. But we'd love to see you guys up here and uh, enjoy a, a couple of weeks up here, a week of learning and a week of holiday. It'd be great. You may want to translate 27 into Fahrenheit or you'll scare everybody to death. <laughs> It's about 85. Yeah, okay, 90. okay. It's perfect temperature. The, yeah. They're thinking you're uh-huh. going uh, swimming when it's below freezing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we do that, of course, but uh, no, no, we're not that tough. Okay. Well, John, thanks so much for uh, challenging as usual. Uh, you've just uh, opened my mind again and got me thinking along some new avenues and just appreciate your faithfulness and what you're doing. I know people, if they're interested in having you come and speak, uh, do grand rounds, preach, do a high school graduation, uh, talk to doctors' groups, uh, you're more than willing, and and I just appreciate your faithfulness in being an ambassador across this country for Christ and really challenging all of us to a deeper walk. Well, I have to say thank you to you guys, too, because I would not have done what I'm doing but for your encouragement and the encouragement of uh, uh, a lot of uh, American physicians. Let me just finish with one lovely moment in April. I had thought that in taking leave from the university I would need to increase my debt with the bank, so I'd arranged a line of credit. And at the end of the first year, I'd just done my tax calculations, which go in at the end of April in uh, in Canada, and uh, yeah, I was going to have to draw on a couple of thousand bucks from my line of credit. But I had one last thing to do in uh, Minnesota uh, before I had to... Uh, file. And uh, the last thing I did at Bethel College was uh, a dinner for the medical alumni. And at the end of the dinner, one uh, doctor came up to me and he gave me an envelope. He said, I just want to give you this to encourage you because I don't think uh, you realize uh, how important what you're doing is. And I thought, well, thank you very much, I said, thinking it'd be a nice little note. And I didn't even open it immediately. It was some 24 hours later when I got away that I opened it and inside there was a check for 1500 US. Hmm. So I didn't have to draw on my line of credit. <laughs> God's good, isn't he? He is indeed. <laughs> he is indeed. Who would have missed that? Oh, that's true. I mean, that's... it's much better to pay that way than to have it all in line, isn't it? There's yeah. some deep sense in which you realize that you're being cared for at a very deep level. Yeah. God bless you, John. And you too. <laughs> <laughs>